Miss Shearer? Not a problem I ever have, <laughs> pulling down a microphone. <laughs> I'm envious. Good morning, Your Honors. I represent the four police officers who've been sued in this case uh, from the city of Cambridge. And as you know, we've appealed asserting a number of errors of law committed by the district court. And these errors are first, uh, the refusal of the district court to grant the officers federal qualified immunity. Second, the refusal of the district court to limit plaintiff's award for the unlawful entry to nominal damages. And third, the trial court's errors with respect to the jury instructions that were and were not given to jury. Now, with respect to qualified immunity, the jury's verdict sheet, which is uh, in the record at JA uh, 1091, Joint Appendix 1091, indicates that the officers violated Andrew Cornish's constitutional rights by failing properly to knock and announce before entering Cornish's apartment. So, it's our contention that the verdict sheet can only be read to mean that the officers knocked and announced at Mr. Cornish's apartment door, but that they failed to wait a sufficient amount of time before entering. Counsel, what, do you think, what would the jury have checked if they thought that they did not knock and announce at all? That was the only form of the question on the so that's verdict what sheet. they would have checked. If they thought there was no knock and announce at all, they would have checked that box. That's correct, Your Honor. So then how do we know which, which it is that they thought? Well, the reason we know is based on the evidence and then also based on jury note three. So it's not about the form. The form doesn't tell us what the jury thought. The form really doesn't tell us because it, it says failed properly to knock and announce. If you object to the form, it seems to me that, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but the burden was, was on your clients to... Um, to establish their defense of qualified immunity, did they ask for a specific jury form that would have allowed us to answer this question, what the jury thought happened? No, Your Honor. Okay. I don't believe every, either party asked the court to do that. But it would have been, I mean, the other party wouldn't have asked. The other party would have had no reason to make, um, to put forth a special jury form that would have allowed you to make your case, right? The burden was on you. The burden for qualified immunity is on us. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay, but it, Um, understandably, th this is what the verdict said and this is what the jury ch checked. Um, but we know the meaning of what the jury checked based on the evidence and, as I said, based on jury note three. So the evidence is the testimony by the... Jury note three about knocking on the outside door versus the inside door. That's correct, Your Honor. So jury note three... Jury note three shows that what was in the jury's mind was whether the officers waited a reasonable <laughs> amount of time before entering the apartment. Why, 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 where did, how do you get that out of that note? Jury note three asked the court, does the legal start time uh, for the waiting period begin at the front exterior door? So they wanted to know from the judge whether the wait time began at the front door of this house or at the apartment? She said the, the, note, the question didn't say anything about wait time, did it? Am I reading from the wrong page? Does the knock and announce legally start at the exterior door or at the apartment door? Ex exactly. Okay, so it doesn't mention wait time. No, it says does the knock and announce start, but I, I but think I think it's that's important because there's nothing about this note that suggests that the jury was thinking about wait time. They just wanted to know, where do you have to knock? Well, that's, that's one way of looking at it, but I think it's, it's, it's certainly a reasonable inference that that means they're... If you don't have a, a, a special verdict, a special interrogatory to answer the question, and you've got more than one possible answer, and there's evidence in the record to support that answer... Well, there is no evidence... Leave it up to the jury. Well, no, there, were, there was testimony from the people who lived downstairs they didn't hear anything upstairs. And they would be able to hear things upstairs. That's what they said. You may not believe it, but the jury might believe it. There was no non-speculative evidence to dispute the officer's testimony that they knocked and announced. 
Ms. Camper testified that she was asleep or half asleep when the police broke her door open. She testified that the only noise she heard was some footsteps running up the stairs just before the boom. Then police were inside her apartment, hollering and shouting and creating a big commotion, trying to secure the two of them. Um, so there's all this commotion going on in her house, and Camper testifies that she did not hear the police break open Cornish's apartment door with a sledgehammer, nor did she hear the two gunshots. Uh, we know both of those things occurred, and she still didn't hear them. So the fact that she didn't hear the knock and announce by the officers at the upstairs apartment door, while we know all this commotion was going on in her own apartment, is not material evidence that would dispute the officer's testimony that they did knock and announce. But Judge Legg thought that um, there was material evidence to send this to a jury, right? And I think he talked not only about the testimony that the downstairs neighbors hadn't heard the knock and announce at Cornish's door, but also the evidence that they were um, synchronized. The plan was to do synchronized, identical entries, and the neighbors also had not heard a knock and announce at their door. And when you put all of that together, Judge Legg thought, well, that's enough to go to a jury on, right? Um, the plan was to do synchronized knocks and announces at each apartment, but that plan did not come to fruition because when the police arrived to execute the search warrants, the front door was locked. So they knocked and announced at the front door, and there's no material non-speculative evidence to dispute that. Well, the fact that someone would say, I usually don't lock that door, doesn't dispute the officer's testimony that when they arrived that day, the door was locked. They knocked and announced, and then they, they breached that door with a battering ram, a 25-pound battering ram. So let's, let's and so assume, the, okay, hold on. Okay. Let's assume they locked it at the outside door before they got into the common area. How does that help you with the knock and announce upstairs? Well, the residents of, of uh, the downstairs apartment, Mr. Ladding and Ms. Camper, say that they didn't hear the knock and announce at the front door, and they didn't hear the battering ram knock it down. They claim they didn't hear the knock and announces at their own door. And, um, you know, I mean, the, they also say they were asleep. So the inference is they didn't hear it because they were asleep. Ms. It's not that it didn't happen. Ms. Shearer, I, I don't want to tell you how to structure your argument. But... If you are, if you perceive perhaps that you're not making a tremendous amount of headway on this one, do you have other arguments you would like to present? Yes, Your Honor. Um, also, we assert. I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut off. No, if there's any other questions about the qualified immunity, I think there's no question that the law was not clearly established uh, in May 2005 as to what was required of a reasonable wait time. And also, I think. But that, that assumes that the wait time is the Was dispositive it issue. issue. That's correct, Your Honor. Right, I'll move on to proximate cause. Um, in this uh, case, we assert that the district court erred in refusing to limit the plaintiff's damages to nominal damages only. And the basis for that argument is the lack of legal proximate causation between the unlawful entry and the um, lawful shooting of Mr. Cornish by Officer Brian Lewis. And so um, the background here is that the district court, prior to Mr. Kane's first appeal to this court, uh, which was dismissed for lack of jurisdiction, Judge Benson Legg held that Mr. Cornish's misapprehension I, I could not... Think we know that. Okay. Well, our proximate causation argument is based on case law from other circuits. Uh, the issue has not been addressed in this circuit, except that in this court's unpublished opinion, um, when it remanded the case for lack of jurisdiction, this court stated that uh, the district court's limitation of wrongful death damages to nominal damages and Kane's voluntarily abandoning his estate claim for, merely foreclosed the possibility of his recovering a certain type of damages. And then this court went on to state... We're familiar with that, and that's, that's not a binding opinion. Why don't you tell us about right. being cases like that? 
Okay. Um, the cases we rely, rely upon are from the third, the sixth, the ninth, and the tenth circuits. Um, the third circuit case is Warwick versus Bodine, and that was a case that was decided in uh, 1995. And in that case, uh, the court noted law holding that like a tort plaintiff, a Section 1983 plaintiff must establish both causation in fact and proximate causation. And the cases uh, hold that under basic principles of tort law, the officers are liable only for the harm proximately or legally caused by the failure to knock and announce, and not for harm caused in the philosophic or but for sense. What is your argument with respect to these facts? These facts regarding we, the lack of proximate cause. Um, the officers. Um, well, we assert that Mr. Cornish's attacking the police with a knife is the superseding cause of his death, and so. We also have a jury verdict where the jury says the shooting death of Mr. Cornish was not wrongful. So there's no wrongful death. You, you, can't, you can't recover for wrongful death when the death itself is, is lawful and not wrongful. Is that, so, a, is that a proximate cause argument? It is in this case because the jury determined that the entry was unlawful. So the question is what damages can the plaintiff recover for that unlawful entry? And there's many cases that have held that only nominal damages will follow um, in a situation such as ours where the occupant um, responds by attacking the police and is killed by a police officer defending himself from that attack. And you can't find that without a proximate cause analysis? Well, it's either a lack of legal proximate cause or, like I said, Mr. Cornish is the superseding cause of his own death. And so in Warwick versus Bodine, the court stated at, um, discussed at length the restatement second of torts and relied upon that to delineate the basic tort principles at show that just because it's foreseeable in this kind of general sense doesn't mean that it follows legally and proximately that it's the cause of the entry caused the death. Now, I thought that case um, was distinguishable or arguably distinguishable because, distinguishable because there was no suggestion there that um, the person who attacked the police didn't know he was attacking the police, that he didn't know he was dealing with the police. And I understand the argument in this case to be, no, no, this one's different because in this case the jury could reasonably have found that until the moment he died, Cornish, who had been awakened at 4.30 in the morning, people bursting into his apartment, didn't understand that he was dealing with the police. He, you know, he ran out there with a knife because he thought he was confronting unlawful intruders in his home. And that makes this case different because that kind of a result is more foreseeable than someone deciding to attack the police. Well, I'm not sure that it matters legally whether the occupant knows or doesn't know it's the police. But in this case, Judge Legg held, before his rulings were reversed by Judge Mott, uh, Judge Legg held, and, and we submit he correctly held, that there's no material evidence to dispute the officer's testimony. Um, and the, the evidence that's there is that they're yelling to identify themselves as police. They're yelling, police search warrant. The evidence is that they're wearing all sorts of police narcotics gear um, Dark, right? that say police. No, the evidence is that it was well lit. The kitchen light was on. The kitchen light's kind of like in the, the center of the apartment. See that the knife was in a sheath, right? He didn't know that, so it, I mean, the visibility must have been somewhat limited. It all happened very quickly. It's hard to see what's going on. The officer mistook a sheath knife for an open knife, and it's all happening very fast. And the conditions for visibility aren't fabulous, right? Otherwise, um, surely the officer could have told the difference between a knife and a sheath and a knife that's not in a sheath. Well, there was there was also light coming from a television that was on in the living room. Well, the, um, but the judge Leg, I mean, in in its finding, and this is a very odd procedural posture to me, found that King couldn't recover actual that there could be no actual damages uh, because a reasonable juror would have to find that Cornish knew he was advancing on police with a knife prior to the shooting, and that the decision to do so constituted a superseding cause of death. What do we make, I mean, 
how does that inform our analysis? Well, I, I'm not sure that it does, Your Honor. I think, you know, he attacked Officer Lewis and... Did you hear my question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm asking, you don't think that the, the first district court's finding in your favor is useful? Yes. I, that's why I cited the Judge Legg's uh, ruling. Yeah, but that. you said it doesn't inform our analysis, so that was why I was wondering. Oh, okay. I see. My time is up, I yes. see. My answer? Uh, yes. Um, it, it, there's no evidence to dispute that he had to have known that it was the police in his apartment, um, and we don't know what he really thought because he's not alive to testify, but it does inform the analysis. I didn't mean to say that it does not. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank we you have some much. time reserved for rebuttal. May it please the court. And, uh, I represent Andrew Kane. Uh, I would like to just jump in to the last question and uh, indicate that Judge Legg's decision does not inform this court's analysis. And the reason for that is that Judge Motz rescinded that decision. That decision, uh, <clears throat> and so it's off the table. And Judge Motz thought. And, and, but it's in the record. Maybe in the record, Your Honor, but Judge Motz made the decision, and he had the authority, which is not challenged on appeal, mm -hmm. to rescind that decision. In his view, uh, it, at least implicitly, it was a factual question, just as he thought that the excessive force issue was a factual question for the jury to decide. That's really, and Judge Moss's authority is not questioned here on appeal. So it's really off the table, now, and I, it's a matter of interest. I think if you want to dwell on that, I could just say this. Judge Legg thought that the survival claim, that there was a claim for emotional harm, that Mr. Cornish may have experienced up until the time he was shot. I found that to be contradictory to the... You all, you withdrew that. Yeah, that I, we withdrew went. that, we did, and we did so because... You wanted uh, to be able to appeal. Correct, yeah. exactly so. Let, let me tell you the, the problem that I have with the damage award. The court's charge to the jury asked them to determine whether the amount of force used was that which a reasonable officer would have employed under similar circumstances. I'm reading, so that, that is the charge. And the, jury, the jury's verdict found in favor of the officers pursuant to that charge. That charge tells us that the amount of force was non-tortious. So what's the 200, wait, so how is the damages award sustainable as a, if the amount of force was appropriate? Let me, let me answer that question. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> there can be more than one constitutional violation that causes an injury. And I think that's clear from the Bodine case, that the court in Bodine in the Third Circuit said you, these... I these, understand that, but right. on these facts... Okay, uh, yeah, let me explain why that is. The, the jury could have said, we're not persuaded that this was an excessive use of force for the following reason, that this officer, not, we're not going to second guess the officer's use of deadly force here because... He may, this may have been very, very quick, and he's... We can't well, find that. Based on, it's, it's rather, just as it would be difficult for us to read, try to read the minds of the jury um, on what was troubling them about the knock and announce, we have to go by what the jury decided when they resolved the question whether the amount of force was that which a reasonable officer would have employed under similar circumstances. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, but I think if... if uh, and I don't think, I don't see how you can get to it. Well, let me, permit me to okay. finish. Absolutely. Now. Um, what I'm saying is they could have logically concluded that they were unwilling to second-guess the officer's use of force because this was a quick situation. 
he may have come out with a, with a knife in a sheet, but they were unwilling to second-guess that use of force. But they concluded, and there was evidence to support this, that there was another violation that, that put the officer and Mr. Cornish in this deadly encounter, a violent encounter, mm -hmm. which the purpose of the rule, the knock-and-announce rule, is to avoid. And so they could have concluded that the knock-and-announce rule was violated and that it was a proximate cause of the shooting. In other words, they could reject this idea that uh, my opponent alleges, which is based upon the excessive force verdict, somehow or another she derives from that that the jury thought that Cornish knew and intentionally attacked the officers. That's the jury was free from the evidence to find to the contrary, that contrary to that, he did not know that he was dealing with the police. This is 4.30 in the morning. The evidence supports a finding that they did not knock and announce. So he is confronted, the officer is confronted by someone who's coming to the door quickly. Maybe the jury did believe that he had a sheathed knife in his possession, but that they were not willing to second guess the officer's use of force. But that does by no means means that Mr. Cornish knew, knowingly attacked the police. However, you do have this intervening event, whether and it's Mr. Cornish who's advancing on the officer, and the question then comes up, well, is that event either or and proximate cause, or was that just a superseding act that caused it? You might want to address that, because right. it seems like the follow-on question I think that, oh, wait a minute. Okay, I'm sorry. I think that's a jury question. The, the jury was properly instructed on proximate cause. Uh, it's a jury question. The jury had facts before it to conclude that there was no knock and announcement and that Mr. Corner, Cornish approached the door not knowing it was the police. And therefore, that the cause, the legal cause of his death was the failure to knock and announce. He was shot on the spot. Of course, you know that the officers told a different version. Their version was they knocked and announced at Cornish's door, penetrated all the way back to Mr. Cornish's door, bedroom door, kicked on that door. The door flew open, knocked one of the point man down, and then Mr. Cornish uh, came out of that room with a knife over his hand, yelling, and, a, and the officer backed all the way up to the kitchen. The jury had evidence to dispute that version. They, they had evidence there was no knock and announce at all. That Cornish in his shorts um, probably heard, heard the crash of his door and jumped up and went, grabbed a knife if he did or didn't, and went immediately to the front door and was shot on the spot by the officer who was a skilled marksman shooting him not in center mass where he said he aimed, but in the head, in the head. They, because they could have said, look, we're not going to second guess the officer's use of force here because in our view, under that scenario, he faced an imminent threat to his life. We're not going to second guess that use of force. But we do find that there was a knock and announce violation. This explains as is a proximate cause of the, uh, the death of Cornish because it happened very quick, right there, three feet from the front door. He's responding to the door, which has been crashed in. And that's how this incident happened. Counsel, can I ask you a question about excessive force? Because I want to make sure I understand um, the law in this area. And so as I understand it, certainly in the Fourth Circuit, 
in deciding whether the officer used excessive force, you only look at the moment the gun was fired. And I, I remember the defendants argued it this way in front of the jury. They said it's a snapshot. You look only at the snapshot, that one moment when the gun is fired. So, so in I just want to, so that it would not have been proper for the jury in considering the use of force to sort of consider how the police got themselves in a situation where it was required that they use force, right? You don't, the jury can't. Uh, I think it, you're, that's exactly correct. Okay. They would have had a situation where they're saying, look, we're only supposed to look at the situation when he fired the shot. And, you know, look, when he fires the shot, this man is right on him. He could have possibly reasonably thought his life was in danger. Therefore, we're not going to second guess that use of force. However, they could say, look, there was a clear violation of the knock and announce principle here that we find, and that's what led to this encounter. That's what got Mr. Cornish shot, because he's coming to the door not knowing it's the police. He's coming to the door with a knife, let's say, not knowing it's the police, and ends up getting shot. Uh, in our brief, it's interesting, we quote from an old, old case uh, where the Supreme Court, in the concurring opinion, talks about this scenario where someone shoots what they, who, someone they think is a prowler or, uh, coming into their house. And the judge says, how can you blame that resident if there's no notice of who's coming into the house? And that's the whole purpose of this knock and announce rule, to protect life and limb for safety, to ensure that things like this don't happen, that the officer is not mistaken for an invader, a home invader. Uh, this is to protect the officer and it's to protect uh, the resident. And that's, since that rule was violated, it follows the jury had sufficient evidence to say this is not just but for. It's an actual controlling factor. It's foreseeable that someone that the officers don't knock and announce, someone could approach the door, be viewed as an imminent threat, and be shot. Uh, so that, I think, uh, clearly the jury had that evidence before them and could find that it was a proximate cause. The failure to knock and announce was there a was no, And that the circumstance, there was no superseding cause, is your argument? There was no superseding. That is, Cornish's conduct was not a superseding cause because, under the restatement, if the actor's conduct creates the risk which causes the injury, it's not a superseding cause. That is. Yeah, there can be. Yeah. I mean, it, right. it's, there, it is still possible that something else intervenes that oh, it's influences. possible if the jury correct if the jury had found the officer's version of events i think they could have found that clearly but all we have is failure to properly knock and announce and the excessive force finding that those are the only two things we're working with right here. that's correct okay. but we have a whole a lot of evidence here what the jury could i think the court has to respect did the jury have sufficient evidence to find what I am asserting here uh, was found, the type of violation which occurred. <coughs> and can I ask a question? Um, just, well, please, can I just ask, sure. we're moving on just a little bit. I have a sort of a procedural question that has actually been unclear to me about this case. So there's one verdict in this case for $250,000? There's a verdict both on federal constitutional violation and a state oh, kind of for $250,000, okay. correct. And, and that sort of merges both of those violations. Yes. Okay, so I'm just trying to figure out, this may affect sort of how, mm -hmm. which issues we need to reach in writing an opinion. So if there was no immunity for the defendants on either the federal claim or the state claim, right, just assume, I, I'm mm -hmm. totally making this up, but let's say mm -hmm. they are not immune on the federal claim, but they are immune on the state claim, they would still be liable for the two, full $250,000, yeah, they right? Right, they would be liable for the $250,000. Now, the... The municipality is a little bit different situation mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> because there is a cap, a Maryland cap, on their liability at 200, right. and uh, Judge Motz recognized that, amended the judgment to that effect. But if the officers were not um, immune in their personal capacities under the statute, and you say they are not, right. would they be liable for the extra 50? Uh, uh, under, under, we're talking about the state law claim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they, they, they could get the plaintiff, your, your client, could win the 250000 the full 250 if there was no immunity either on the state claim or no immunity on right. the federal claim. Okay. Right, right. I, I mean, 
I think if the question is, well, if the state, if they have, if they also have immunity under the state law claim, what is the effect? Yeah. I mean, well, still, the federal claim would permit a judgment of $250,000. That's right. Okay. So you don't need that. I believe, I believe that's the, and then um, I think that, <clears throat> I guess the only other issue perhaps to address would be the uh, jury instructions. I believe that the, the jury instructions were legally correct. Uh, <clears throat> that is, the court gave them. The court emphasized the fact that the, the manner of the, in which the search was conducted had to be reasonable, that the court, uh, when given the jury note, indicated that the knock and announcement must take place at the inner door, which makes uh, very good sense in this particular case. <clears throat> and I think that for those reasons, the, for all those reasons, the, the judgment should be affirmed below. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Ms. Shearer, you have some time for rebuttal. Uh, Mr. Roberts said that the proximate cause question was a jury question, and I, I believe that's incorrect. I believe it's a legal question, and um, I think that if the jury um, believed what Mr. Robert, Roberts says they believe, they would not have found that the use of force was justified and lawful. And um, so I think that there were a lot of ifs in his argument about what the jury might have believed or might have thought or what their verdict about the, the use of force could mean. But I think that if you look at the evidence without any speculation, the only thing the jury's verdict could have meant is that Andrew Cornish, they believed that Andrew Cornish came flying out of the master bedroom, swinging a knife over his head, charging at Officer Brian Lewis that Officer Brian Lewis yelled at him more than once, drop the knife, drop the knife. He didn't drop the knife. Officer Lewis backed into the barber's chair in the kitchen. He couldn't retreat any further, and he quickly fired two shots. So what about, and, can you, um, I mean, I asked your opposing counsel the same question, but I was struck by the argument um, that you all made at trial, that when you look at excessive force, it's a snapshot. It's one moment in time. You're only looking at the moment the gun was fired. So if that's right, and obviously it is, right, under Fourth Circuit law, then why isn't it plausible that the jury could find both that at that the police did something terribly wrong getting themselves into this situation. There was a wrong. They got themselves into a situation where someone comes running to the door at four, 4 in the morning, has no idea what's going on, thinks he's under attack, and is, in fact, in that moment, a threat to the officer because the officer's just standing there and there's someone with a knife. And so in that moment, in that snapshot of time, it's reasonable for the officer to defend himself but they're not looking back at how the police got themselves in this position where it was foreseeable that someone awakened without a knock and announce is going to think he's under attack. Why don't, given that argument about the snapshot in time, why don't they fit together? Well, because the established case law is that you're not supposed to look at the antecedent conduct of the police, right? Uh, and you can't argue that they created the danger. Right. So it, I it, agree. That's my point. Right. right. <laughs> in, in determining the excessive force claim, but doesn't it, doesn't it follow from that that lots of stuff could have happened before that snapshot that is chargeable to the police and that did cause the situation? I think, like I said, you can't charge them with creating the situation leading to the use of force. But sure, more isn't to the, it equally? I mean, the uh, problem is we don't really know, isn't? I mean, if the officers responded appropriately to the knife. It also means that the police officers had to see a knife, that there was a knife. And it's, it also means that, that under the factual scenario, if they could see a knife, surely Cornish could see that they were police officers because they were in full riot gear. I mean, th there's a lot we don't know, so we're sort of stuck with the jury instruction, what the jury instruction tells us. I'd agree. And whether or not there's proximate cause and superseding cause, et cetera. Well, the jury instruction and the jury's verdict sheet show that they believe that the shooting was non-tortious. And so it, there's no proximate legal cause between the unlawful entry and the shooting you can say it's a cause in fact, but it's not the proximate cause. And I think Mr. Roberts talks about foreseeability, but you can't just say that it's foreseeable if they 
don't knock and announce that someone could get hurt because that's not legal proximate cause and the other circuits have so held. Thank you very much, Ms. Schur. Thank we you. We will ask um, Mr. Coleman to adjourn court for the day and come down and greet counsel. This honorable court stands adjourned until tomorrow morning at 8.30. God save the United States and this honorable court.